All right, well, we'll say good afternoon and welcome to the 2024 National Hurricane Conference Amateur Radio Workshop and Disaster Communications Discussion today. We have a, a great lineup on, here on the agenda. Um, first, um, we'll start off with uh, John Cangiolosi from uh, the National Hurricane Center. He's going to give a kind of review of the past season. Um, regrettably, Bob Robichaud, who's been at like every one of our workshops uh, since uh, the early 2010s, uh, couldn't make it this year, but we have a short video from him to kind of go through the future season and talk a little bit about the Canadian Hurricane Center, because believe it or not, um, the Canadian Maritimes have been a bit of a hurricane alley in the last few years. They've had probably just as many tropical system to post-tropical hybrid impacts as uh, um, here in Florida. So um, Bob will talk a little bit about that. We'll have Julio Rapol for the uh, amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center, WX4NHC overview. We've got Bobby Graves for the uh, Hurricane uh, WatchNet overview. We'll take a break, and then um, I'll present um, on the VOIP Hurricane Net and talk about best practices for in Skywarn for tropical systems because we shouldn't just be active for hurricanes. We can help out in tropical storms and in remnant tropical system situations that are uh, can also be as impactful as some of the bigger storms. Um, from there, we'll have a talk on the Salvation uh, Army Team Emergency Radio Network, a, a quick video overview there. We have Josh Johnston from ARL Headquarters who will talk about um, updates on Aries and the ARL. And then we have a personal story from K1CE Rick Palm who writes our Aries e-letter and he'll talk us through his experience during Hurricane Idalia. And then we'll have a moderated Q&A and then door prizes for those in the room. So apologies to our folks on the live stream uh, you have to be present to win the uh, door prizes. So just a quick overview of the agenda. And uh, I'll just queue up uh, John's presentation here. And All right, and here we go. We got his presentation up. So again, I'll introduce John Cangiolosi. He's going to talk through the summary of the hurricane season. He's one of the uh, hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center. John. All right, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello on the line. So I'm, again, I'm John Cangiolosi. I'm one of the senior hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, show of hands, anybody been to the National Hurricane Center here? So a bunch of you guys. Now, the reality is, I first want to thank you for everything you do. Because the reality is that the data that's provided in real time is so beneficial to us assessing what's happening on the ground. We really need that information. And then secondly, it helps us again in post-analysis when we have to reestablish what happens for the records, for insurance purposes, just for so many reasons. So what I'm going to do for you guys is I want to talk about what happened last year. If you want to have any conversation about what we think is coming this year, we can do that too. I'm happy to take questions. And if there's really anything you want to know about the hurricane forecast program in general, I'm really here to answer any questions you guys might have. So some of this was mentioned at the general session yesterday, but we can talk about it in more detail now. So the 2023 season in the Atlantic Basin was a little above average. We had 20 named storms, that's considerably above the average of 14. But we had seven hurricanes and three major hurricanes that is right on the money of what is considered average. By the way, average is over the preceding 30 years. So we just take an average of that period. The metric that we like using best is more scientific. It's called accumulated cyclone energy. Anyone ever hear that term? Okay, so it's like one or two. And all that is is a metric of how long lived the storms were, how strong they were, and the realities and how long they lasted. And that was about 20% above the average. The reason that number is more meaningful is we can get an inflated number of storms that just last a day or two but are unconsequential. That ACE number is way more meaningful, especially to meteorologists. All right, so of the storms we had, there was a lot of impacts. Um, and of course, this is where you all come in. So Brett affected the Windward Islands as a tropical storm. Franklin affected Hispaniola also as a tropical storm. Harold went into Texas as a tropical storm. Idalia was the big one of the year, was a major hurricane in this state in the Big Bend area, and also for Cuba. Lee was a hurricane, believe it or not, way up in New England, as mentioned. Atlantic Canada has been a hotspot for hurricanes, strangely enough. 
Ophelia was almost a hurricane that went into the Carolinas, and Philippe and Tammy were both tropical storms that went through the Leeward Islands. So you can see there were a bunch of consequences from 2023. Now in the Pacific, which we care about too, this was actually even more active. Not in terms of the total number. There were 17 storms, we had 20 in the Atlantic, but these were more consequential. There were 10 hurricanes and eight of them were major hurricanes. And that eight number is really important because that's double of what we normally see and Mexico had significant impacts. There were three hurricanes that made landfall in, in that country. Lydia, Norma, and then Otis being the big one for Acapulco. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. And there were three additional tropical storms that made landfall. Hillary that actually made it all the way into Southern California, Max and Beatrice, all of that intensity. All right, so the biggest consequence, the statistic that we don't like sharing every year, something we wanna do something about, what were the fatalities? What storms caused them? What happened exactly? So for Idalia, we lost eight people directly due to the storm. And guess what? All eight were due to surf and rip currents. None of them due to wind or storm surge or tornadoes. And some of them passed away from areas nowhere near the track, but still associated with this wind field. We lost people in New Jersey and in Delaware that decided, hey, it's a pretty nice day out. I'm going to go surfing or get out in the water. And we lost, we lost them. And to be honest with you, one of the concerning factors we've seen with fatalities in the last several years is we're losing more people due to the surf conditions and indirectly due to carbon monoxide poisoning. That's actually surpassing direct influences from wind or storm surge in the last handful of years. There were, two, there were uh, four additional indirect fatalities due to a combination of vehicle accidents and cleanup and things like that. For Lee, there were three direct fatalities. Again, two were for surf and rip currents and one directly from the wind in Maine. And for Hillary, there was one fatality due to freshwater flooding in Southern California. But again, the statistic for 2023 is 83% of the fatalities directly from hurricanes last year was due to surf and rip currents. So there's just more education needed, not only on our end, but on everyone's end to do better here. This has been a lingering issue that we've seen. All right, I'm not sure how aware you are, but the Hurricane Center grades themselves every year. Uh, in fact, it's a part of my job to put out Hurricane Center's report card, so to speak. And we're not super proud of our results in 2023. And I want to explain kind of what went right and what went wrong. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. So please don't be shy. And we definitely accept criticism. We're here to try to do better. So here's the first layer of our report card. Just look at the graph. The blue line represents our track error average together for all of the storms in the Atlantic. And if you look at the left side, you'll see, all right, the number starts off pretty small, but then it gets bigger with time. And that's not unusual, right? The farther out in time we're trying to make a prediction, the more uncertain it is, the bigger the error generally is. And the errors went up by about 40 nautical miles a day, so roughly 50 statute miles a day. If you look in the track error column in the table, none of the numbers are highlighted in green. There were no records broken. Now, switching gears and looking at the orange line, that represents our intensity errors. How far off were we for the entire year averaged together? The numbers there were pretty good. We only broke one record. Our own report card was at the short time period of 12 hours. No other records broken, but the numbers are pretty low. The hurricane center is generally off by about a category, and most of those numbers are smaller than a category. So that's pretty successful. Now, our biggest storm problem for the year, anybody remember the storms last year? Okay, what do you think the hardest storm was for us to predict last year? If you, got, if you remember the storms, give me, give me one. Otis. Otis, okay, that was a tough one. Not the hardest, but tough, toughest for intensity. Give me the toughest for track. Anybody kind of remember any? Probably something you're not even thinking about. Lee was pretty. Lee was okay. I'll show you that in a minute. I got a few examples. The hardest one was Philippe. You don't remember that one, do you? And I don't blame you because it didn't affect a lot of people. But we treat all storms. We're trying to get them all right, regardless of their consequence. If we just take Philippe out and pretend it never existed, our error goes from the solid blue line to the dashed one. That would be a reduction of about 20 to 25%, which is a lot. We had 20 storms. That's just one of them. You take that out and the error goes down that much. 
So I want to talk about what happened with the storm and what could we do better on our end. So that's what this graphic shows. Take a look on the left first. That, the, see the red symbols? That represents what that storm actually did. That's where it traveled. So it eventually did go across the Leeward Islands and then out over the Central Atlantic. Was never a real concern for the continental United States. The individual blue lines that are all plotted there represent the, represent the forecast that we issued in real time. So you can see we started off OK. I'll kind of point to it here on the screen. Oh, you can't see it. We started off OK at the early times. It was all kind of pretty reasonable. But then later, we thought Philippe was going to turn out to sea a little sharper. It didn't happen. And then eventually, we caught on. And then eventually, we thought it was going to accelerate into New England. And that didn't happen. Now, I want to tell you that hurricane forecasting, we get a ton of criticism about this. It is pretty hard. I mean, we're a lot better today than we were 15, 20 years ago when I started. But the reality is, there are still a lot of curveballs that are thrown our way. And this was one of them. It was very connected to what, how strong we thought Philippe was going to be. So take a look at the figure on the right. The black line represents Philippe's actual strength throughout its entire lifetime. And what do you notice? If you look at this, it stays all in one sort of color code, right? The whole time, it was a tropical storm. It never got to a hurricane. In fact, the whole time, it was kind of flatlined. It didn't change. It bounced around 10 or 15 miles an hour difference. But our forecast wasn't so great. First, we thought Philippe was going to strengthen. Then we thought it was going to weaken. Then we thought it was going to strengthen again. The best forecast that I made the entire time was when I just thought, I don't know what this storm's going to do. I'm just going to hold it steady the whole next five days. And that was the best forecast I issued. So I just want to let you know that there are curveballs. Now, we use a whole bunch of models. You guys have heard of the weather models, I'm sure, right? And if, if there's anything you hear in this conference, and you know, I've been teaching here the last couple, last day or two, everyone sort of has their favorite weather model. You know, they're like, oh, any, any of you know weather models? Raise your hand if you do. OK, a few of you. So how do the weather models do for this storm? Well, that's what's shown here in this graph. So you can see all of the weather models are showing Philippe sharply turning to the north and then eventually northeast, headed away from the Leeward Islands. So where did the storm actually go? it tracked along that black line. So if you're sitting down making a forecast, is there any way you're going to predict Philippe to do something different than every single weather model? The point is this, is this happens every year. And every year we're told that my model's the best, this is amazing. But every year we can find cases where there's just everything fails. And there's still a need for a human to get involved and interact. And we beat the weather models. We're not proud of our prediction. We beat these weather models. But the reality was, it still wasn't a great service. So in our discussions, here's how we were trying to message this complexity. We kept saying, we're not sure. Over and over again, we mentioned, we're uncertain. Our confidence is low. And we said that 58 times in our tropical cyclone discussions. That's how hard this case was. This case could happen near the United States. There's no reason this happens geographically. The reason I'm telling you this is this could happen anywhere that you're, in, you're interested in. So, and this, this is one of those complexities. So this was our biggest loss of the season. So I want to move on to some of the bigger wins. All right, so let's talk about Hillary. Now, if you remember the storm, this was really unusual. We had a storm that was, it was category four at one point, and it was set to go to Southern California. It was all over the media. Oh, and it was like the apocalypse. This is already people were changing to climate change. And by the way, I'm not saying there isn't climate change, but you can't mix scales. We can't look at an individual storm and compare it to something large scale like climate. There was the track. The red line represents where it went. The blue lines represent our forecast. Take a look on the right. You can't argue that those forecasts aren't good. I mean, those were on the money. Days and days, we had good anticipation that Hillary was going to go to Southern California, and indeed it did actually caused much more damage in Baja, California, where it was a lot stronger. But they did get some rain and wind, and again, one fatality in Southern California. On the left represents our intensity forecast. And I'll call this mostly a success. You could see Hillary went up to a Category 4, and you could see our blue lines. We knew Hillary was going to strengthen, but we didn't quite get the timing right. You could see we predicted it to reach its peak a little later, and then it weakens a little faster than we thought, too. But predicting this evolution, I'll tell you, 5 or 10, 15 years ago, we would have never been able to do that, for example. So it really does show the progress in this field. 
All right, one closer to home. Let's look at Idalia. So here is the prediction for Idalia over and over again. The red line, red symbols represent where Idalia went. This looks really great too. Our forecasts were very consistent. Those that were interested in the landfall spot, that only changed by 75 miles across its track. So we kept painting the Big Bend over and over again. This is going to the Big Bend. This is going to the Big Bend. We got media call after media call in operations. Is this going to go to the right like Ian did? Because that's what Ian did. It was going to Tampa, right? Our prediction. And then it slid to the right. And we kept saying, no, this is a different setup. We, I got actually students to check biases because the, we had accusations that we don't handle these types of tracks right. Ian was a tough case. But we, we nailed Idalia. This was really very much on the money. And looking at Idalia's strength, this was our predictions for its intensity. And you can see this is pretty well captured, too. Maybe some of the early forecasts were a little too low, but later on we predicted it to strengthen sharply, and then we predicted it to weaken sharply, and all of that panned out pretty well. We captured the peak right, we captured the landfall intensity in Florida, generally right. So the messaging here was on point. And what I'm trying to get through to you guys is that every case is different. And when we teach people, it's really hard to know, are we gonna give you very good and accurate information like we are for Idalia, or are we gonna put out information like Philippe? And we just don't know that with a lot of lead time, unfortunately. All right, so here's Lee. You brought this up. So Lee was part win, part loss. So here's the win. So on the left, look at the track forecasts. Those look great. Very tight. Didn't really move it. Over and over again, predicting a strange track for this to turn sharply northward and go into coastal Maine and Atlantic Canada as a really significant storm. And that is what happened. Um, th there was one model that did actually better than us, and that was the GFS, the American model. That was its win for the year. It was a pretty bad model last year, but it did well for this one. And if you're curious how we figure out where to put these tracks and intensities, there's a lot of experience in human intervention. There's, we don't have like a computer algorithm that spits out the forecast. The human is actually sitting down and subjectively making those decisions. Predicting the strength of Lee was challenging, and this is part of the loss. Look how sh sharp its intensity was. Look at the black line. Look how it went up from a tropical storm to a category five hurricane in two days. Predicting that kind of rate of strengthening is really, really challenging. Now, we didn't do badly. In fact, our second discussion said it is becoming a question of when and not if rapid intensification occurs with Lee. But look what happened after it touched Cat 5. That top blue line, unfortunately, is mine. That was the worst forecast issued for the storm. And Lee weakened from a Cat 5 to a Cat 2 in two days. Didn't see that one coming. And then it recovered, and the rest of it's just a little bit more easy to predict. But hurricanes, they're really unpredictable animals, the reality. And we're trying our best to chase these things. Some of them are more predictable than others. OK, I want to talk briefly about Otis, because this was the worst one of the year in terms of impacts. So I want to illustrate how hard this can be sometimes. On the left is a satellite image of Otis at 1 AM Central Time on October 24th. At that time, that circulation, and we have the hurricane hunters look at it, they found peak winds of 50 miles an hour. Remember, it's only about a day from landfall. So you're like, all right, how bad could this be at landfall? It's 50 miles an hour. The picture on the right is at landfall, exactly 24 hours later. It was 165 miles an hour in one day. Tropical storm to a category five hurricane in one day, this is exceptional. This rate of intensification occurs about once in every 20 years. The problem here is it happened just before landfall. The reality is we see this over the ocean sometimes, and maybe it goes unrecognized, or if we make a mistake, it's not as highlighted, not as consequential, but this is about as bad as it really gets. I want to show you the real-time tools we had available to us. So kind of look at this four panel, and I know it's maybe a little hard to see, but I'll just point out what you need to know. The black line in every single one of those represents what actually happened with Otis's strength. The colored lines represent the different predictions. So the top left one is what NHC did. The right one is some models that are statistical. They're hurricane specific. The ones at the bottom left those are also hurricane specific, but they're dynamical, meaning they're actually trying to figure out what's happening with this specific case. And the one on the right is the American GFS global model. The reality is 
there was no information from any of these models that this would happen. So anytime you hear, you hear complaints about what happens with meteorologists, realize the tools are still insu insufficient. There still needs to be improvement to actually get the level of this detail right. And even though we're not happy with our performance, it was better than all of the other models given to us. Like I was on shift during Otis, and I, I remember predicting it to be a category one hurricane. I had no, no support for that at all from any of the models. Just a really challenging thing. So speaking of Otis specifically, I want to map how this stands with our history. So this is looking at only cases that have rapidly intensified. This is just forget every other storm. We're looking at the subset of the storms that intensify by at least 35 miles an hour in one day. So if you look at the chart on the left, that represents all of those cases that I just mentioned, all of the rapid intensif intensifying cases from 2015 to 2017. So imagine we're on shift together. We're forecasters together. Our job is to hit that black line. That's our job. That's zero error. What we actually produce for all of those cases are denoted by those red bars. So what do you see when you look at the shape of this? Every, most of it's off to the left, right? Most of it's to the left of the black line which means we were too low. Our average error for that subset is being 22 miles an hour too low. On the right is the same philosophy, but just from 2021 to 2023. Now when you look at the shape of the data, you still see it's still too low, it's off to the left, but it's getting closer to the black line. And our average now is 13 miles an hour too low. So everything's getting better. I think if we're here in five or 10 more years, and we show this similar sort of analysis, everything's going to be around the black line. This is finally seeing some progress. And I'm excited about this because if we were here in 2005, 2010, we would have told you our track predictions are getting better, but we're just not making our progress with intensity predictions. That's no longer true. So this is kind of a new result over the last five or 10 years. Now, Otis was the exception. You could see where our errors were for Otis. They were off the chart bad. I mean, we thought this was going to be a category one, and it was a category five. So this is not OK. Here's how we handle this from the, in the science community. We have meetings just like this one. We're going to one in May. We went to one back in November. And we're looking at the modelers, the, the weather modelers, and saying, what happened here? You know, I mean, we, we're relying on this information. What did we miss? What happened? I'm, I'm just going to be blunt with you guys, we, we, don't, we didn't get any answers, okay? I mean, we're, we're still waiting. But now researchers are studying this. But the problem is it takes years to actually figure this out and advance these models. And we use models from all around the world. There's some here, and there's a bunch, of course, run in the United States, but we use the Canada's model. We use, of course, the, there's two different European models that we use. Um, and they all failed. Every single one failed. That's the reality. So sure, some models are better than others, but there are some cases, like Otis and Philippe, where everything fails. That's just the reality. So I just want to summarize this, and then I want to talk more about your observations just briefly and casually. So here are the challenges in 2023. The rapid intensification for Otis, as I just pointed out. The inconsistent model forecast for Philippe led to really large errors. But fortunately, the landfalling systems in the United States were well captured. And that was just luck. I can't tell you. We've had landfalling cases that they have been poor. Now, there is an argument that we get better data near land, and that sure does help. Um, but, but there are cases where sometimes there's, there's just busts there, too. So that's kind of what I have for the season. Before continuing, I want to make sure I stay on time. Are there any questions about what happened last year or anything about hurricane season in general? Yeah. I do have one quick question. Rapid intensification, is that becoming a more common occurrence? Because it gives us an awful lot of hard in terms of we're going to activate our public assistance evacuation. You know, the state needs time to activate all these contracts. And I know there's not what we can do about it. We can go back and tell our leadership that this is something that's becoming more free. It has. I mean, and if we just look back, we've definitely seen an uptick since about the mid 2010s. Now, whether that's sustainable and keeps going, I can't say that. But if we're just looking back and not forward, the trend is up. These are more frequent. It's a good question. Yeah. Yep. Category two, and that is a 
That was the worst storm of the year for sure. And so Maria, you're right. For Dominica, it often gets forgotten because the emphasis gets put back on like Puerto Rico. But that was rapid intensification at its worst. That is just like Otis that I was saying for that year. The storm intensified so quickly. Here's what's needed for rapid intensification. I'll kind of explain it and where the state of the science is. So in order to get a storm to rapidly intensify, you need a few things. One, the, the vertical wind shear in the atmosphere needs to be very low. And, and all that means is the storm wants to grow straight up and down, but the wind shear can tilt it over left or right. So if the wind shear is low, that's, you can check that box that it's possible. Second, need a lot of surrounding moisture. That's not usually a problem in the Caribbean. And also a lot of warm water and deep warm water, that's almost always a fixture in the Caribbean. The third thing and the last thing that's needed, and, and this is what we didn't know in Maria's case, is is it going to develop an eye and eye wall pattern quickly? Sometimes that process takes days. Sometimes that process takes hours. And what happened in that specific case is it happened quickly. And by the time we saw it happening, it was, our forecast was poor. It was too late. And we had to issue special advisories, which is something we don't want to do, to say, we're off track. This thing's taken off. And it catches people off guard. We tell our emergency management community here, and this is even more true for the Caribbean region, but even here in the United States, we say you better prepare for a category higher just in case this happens. Some of that might have to be more there. In our case, we were preparing for a category three. Yep. Because it was a category two. Right. It reached about the maximum intensity of what storms can reach. And we were talking, uh, some of our colleagues were in Panama last week talking to, of course, the Mexican Weather Service, and they definitely want answers for Otis. You know? And we want answers from the modeling community. And it's always being passed around, who, how do we fix this problem? I can tell you that the problem is being fixed, but it's being fixed very slowly. And the problem is, it's still a problem. It's still a problem. I mean, we are better today than we were five, 10 years ago. But to say that we have this figured out is definitely a mistake. And thank you for your honesty. Appreciate it. Yeah. What are the factors that contribute to the rapid intensification, of, such as Otis or Maria? Yeah. So. And, and how, how well uh, equipped is the meteorological, meteorological society to detect these changes? It's a good question. Actually, we're going to talk a lot. If you're interested, we're going to talk a lot about this again tomorrow morning. But I'll kind of give you just a preview of what we're going to show with pictures. Yeah, you got it. And we'll show pictures to show this tomorrow, so if you're interested. But it, it needs some of the ingredients that I said that are large scale. So like, again, got, the water's got to be warm, generally at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but probably warmer than that if it's 85, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The warmer, the better. The temperatures are very correlated to how strong the storm could reach in the maximum sense. We call it maximum potential intensity. Shear's got to be really low. Moisture's got to be high, at least 70% relative humidities. But the other factor is storm's got to actually be small. And it's hard to understand that because you would think that if it's large, it could actually capitalize on that surrounding. But if it's large, just the momentum takes a while for it to turn and accelerate. If it's small, if you think of something small, it could spin fast and just accelerate. So we're actually looking, we are looking for systems that have a small inner core, something with a smaller eye and a smaller eye wall. If it's expansive, that's unlikely to rapidly intensify. So we don't see rapid intensification, let's say, from North Carolina north. It's just those, those environmental factors are not usually there for that to happen. But down here in the Gulf Coast, down in the Gulf Coast, down in the Southeast US, and certainly in the Caribbean, that's the zone where we watch for it. Now, I will share something with you. We're watching our, we call it our probability of detection, which is exactly your question of you're asking. So how often do you detect rapid intensification It happens? We're about 40%. That's just the number we're at. Well, if, if when monitoring Otis, and yep. you yourself said you never saw this coming. Nope. Was it small? Yes. Were the, were the, the, the water temperatures at 85 plus degrees? Did you have deep enough water? Did you have no wind shear? Did you have all of the components that you just described that would have suggested that rapid intensification could and probably will occur? And if so, how was it missed? And I'm not trying to throw no. anybody under the bus. I'm just trying to understand if, if you have all of the components, how can it be missed? Such a good question. And I love, I love the directness related to it. Yes, all that was there. And when I was on shift, all I thought about was, it doesn't have time. I was like, this is a 50 mile an hour tropical storm. It's got one day. 
Now, one of the fears we have at the Hurricane Center is we do not like forecasting rapid intensification and then we miss it. For example, we're, for, we're gonna call Lotus to a cat three and it only gets to a cat one. We hate doing that because we're developing a false, we, don't, we do not want false alarms because that's a concerning for the next one that does do it. So we only like to take those shots when our confidence is high. But your point is well taken. You're right. Nobody has time to get out of the way. No, you're exactly right. This is the worst case scenario. And our lessons learned from this, and we're looking into it. Like, we're like, what could, we obviously know we could have done better, but what went wrong? The reality was we didn't have that, we, we could have fallen back on the large scale fundamentals that I mentioned. That is meteorology 101. And all of that was there. But all of our tools said it's not gonna happen. Every single tool that we use day in, day out said, not going to happen. And we have seen all of that line up before and it still doesn't happen. So it's not a, even if those ingredients are there, it's not a slam dunk. It's ne nothing's a slam dunk. So b when we had all of our tools say, no, it's not going to happen. Maybe, so we went above all of the models. So the model said it's just going to stay a tropical storm. We said, let's make this at least a cat one because of the ingredients being there. But that wasn't clearly enough. The problem for us is the confidence is not there. We've seen cases where we get the environmental, large scale fundamental factors that line up and then we try to fall back on our tools, which is why, just like you're talking to me, I talk to the modeling community just like that. And I'm like, this makes us look bad. We need better information. And I'm waiting for answers. And as soon as I get them, I will, I will certainly relay them to this community. And this frustrates me a lot. And the reason it frustrates me is because we're kind of the middlemen between the science community and the applied community, the, the community that matters the most. So we need to do better here. We do. And thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm on your team. I really am. Yeah. 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 I love being direct. It's great. And you're right. These are mistakes. And that's why we show them. We try to get better. And, you know, I thought, I thought honestly in real time when I think about it, it was only about six months ago, I thought I was doing a brief thing by going above all of my tools. We, we always say, we have this saying inside the Hurricane Center only go outside the model guidance envelope if you're willing to defend yourself in court. Because if, if, if I go to my, if my manager comes to me and I'm wrong, I better have some damn good reasons. And I had them this time. So, I'm, so I, all the models said tropical storm, I'm like, no, I gotta go higher. I, and I went higher, but <laughs> I didn't go but, nearly high enough. But by the same token, yeah. if you go too much higher too many times over and over. Right, the there's the false alarms. So you gotta, you gotta take your shots. You right, so it is a, it is a balance. And it's easier in hindsight than it is in real time, of course, but we still need to learn from these things. Yeah. One thing I can say, those who've been in here over 40 years know the strides y'all make yeah. with, with the forecast. I mean, there's going to be mistakes, unfortunately, but they have come a long way from 20 years, I promise you. <clears throat> 2005 on. Absolutely. Our errors today are about 50% of what they were then. So that's a lot of progress. And of course, I don't see a reason that the progress will stop. You know, and I'm not sure, I actually think we'll get more progress with things like rapid intensification in the next handful of years. And that remains lingering issues that need better model resolution. Perhaps this is where artificial intelligence could actually benefit the community. These models take six hours to run. You know, maybe with new technology, we can get multiple runs and create what we call ensembles that will signal some of this stuff for us. So there's, 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 there's reasons to be hopeful for the future. Okay, great. Am I okay on time? Okay, any other questions? Okay, anybody curious about what's happening next year? <laughs> this year? <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I can just talk about it briefly and, I, and, I, and I'll put a pretty, I'll put a disclaimer that, I don't know if anyone knows Phil Klotzbach. He's from Colorado State. He puts out the seasonal predictions. He's here. You can pick his brain. He's the real expert looking forward. But I could just give you the knowledge that I know and that the general consensus in the meteorology community that's here. And feel free to pick anyone's brain. But I wish, you know, I'm, we're concerned. We're concerned for the, the lineup of potentially consequential factors. You know, the Atlantic Basin's been running warmer than normal for a while now. That's not new for 2024. It's been running, it was warmer than normal last year in 2023. But in some places it's at record warmths. Like we haven't seen it this warm. And we're not talking about climate change. So I don't wanna like, I don't wanna mix scales. You know, one of the problems we have in our 
society is that, you know, there's, there's a difference between what we're saying is happening like this year and what's happening in 50 years or 100 years. We're only looking off ahead months, not years. Um, and we're switching to La Nina. So last year we were in El Nino, which is, if you haven't heard of these terms, they're, they're, they're global cycles, specifically dominated in the Pacific, and they affect sea surface temperature in the Pacific, the equatorial Pacific. And believe it or not, changes in the temperatures along the equator in the Pacific has consequences for the entire world. It's sort of the ripple effect, where if you just mess with something here, it causes uh, some other problem way down there. So I want you to think of it that way. Now, when we were in El Nino, that pattern generally causes stronger wind shear in the Atlantic and keeps hurricanes suppressed. And we did get that last year. I mean, it may not feel like it, but it was running about average to just a little bit above average. And that was a negating factor compared to the record warmth. So they almost canceled out last year. What's happening this year is we switched phase to La Nina and the La Nina is actually strengthening. And what that does is it lowers wind shear in the Atlantic. And when you have a problem of already record warm temperatures and low wind shear in the Atlantic, you have ingredients that are lining up that just don't look good. Now, we don't know where they're going to go, and we, you know, generally we can get a sense of that one at a time or even weeks at a time, but there might be more bullets in the gun, is what I'm trying to say. So, and you know, one of the things we have to do as a community is we take them one at a time, we're all in this together, but the reality is you know, this year there's reasons to be a little bit more concerned. And that's kind of where we're at. And I don't want to deliver bad news, and I can't see the future. I'm just looking at the large-scale factors that we can see from today. And that's kind of where we're at. OK, any questions about that? Yeah. I do have one question. Yeah. Something I read in the Wall Street Journal. Not sure if this would be vetted information. Sure. That is such a good question. It, it, I mean, that, that has been active research, so you're right. So if, if, if those that don't know what he's talking about, so the factor is from the Sahara Desert, there's, there's a lot of dust that comes off. It's, we actually nickname it Sal, Saharan air layer is what we call it. And when there's the Saharan air layer that comes across the Atlantic, storms that intersect with this dry, dusty air typically hiccup. It's not gonna call them to fall apart, but it generally slows their intensification process down. So the Sahar Saharan air layer reaches a peak in June and July, which doesn't exactly intersect with the peak of the hurricane season, unfortunately. So that's why part of the reason why June and July are not as favorable for hurricane development is because of the drier air. But conflicting that is the monsoon in Africa. So there's a broad scale southwesterly flow or a monsoon trough that moves into Africa. And that is obviously going to affect how much dust comes off into the Atlantic. So the idea is, and this has been an active research of the correlation between the two, and the science, is, science community is kind of mixed on it. Um, the reality is it's like, well, obviously, if it's wetter in Africa, then there will be maybe less dust and there will be maybe more hurricanes. But the, the correlations between the two factors are kind of weak. So I wouldn't say that's the biggest factor, but it could be an added, like an added supplemental factor. And that's kind of what, we're, what he's talking about. Okay. Well, if you're thinking of any questions, I just want to say thanks again for everything you do. The data, all of the data that's collected is amazingly beneficial. When I'm on the, the forecast floor and like Julio brings something out, we, we truly get excited because the reality is we're a bit in a vacuum. And I don't know if you can understand what I'm trying to say, but we're, we're looking at computer screens and trying to forecast and do something for people on the ground. But we are removed from that world. And we don't want to be. And this gives us a little sense of what's actually happening outside where, where we're trying to make predictions. And in real time, we don't have a ton of data, especially when it hits sparsely populated areas. Um, even when it hits populated areas, there's still, you know, the data is not always available in real time. A lot of our conventional instruments fail. Um, lots of times when we hear like eyewitness reports about how high the water is or what the damage is like, this is so incredibly useful to us in real time to help message our information, communicate with our local emergency management, and then in post analysis, it helps us tremendously actually figure out what was happening. And I want you to know, after every single storm ends, and I don't know if you know this, we go back and revisit every single thing we did. Every, we have only a team of 10 at the Hurricane Center, that's it. And the team of 10 gets about five storms each, and for those five storms, we reanalyze all of the data, 
reanalyze what we said in real time and adjust. And yeah, we're not cheating. That's, we're not, we're, the, everything I showed you was not adjusted. The reality is we want to get the record right. And the records are important because it affects, it's the history, number one. And number two, it has consequences for insurance, which is not something we need to be concerned with about, but we need to, all of the records are dependent upon data. And the data you give us helps us get the records right. So thanks for everything. Appreciate it, guys.